it's an honor introducing Dennis Tzu, who's the Senior Director of Innovation Programs at SRI International. Um, by way of education, Dennis has a Bachelor of Arts undergraduate degree in economics from Princeton University and an MBA from Stanford University Graduate School of Business up the road. Um, by way of background on SRI, and we'll learn a lot more about it, but SRI's innovation programs, which Dennis leads, help organizations in government, academia, and industry to develop and implement processes that encourage and manage innovation and entrepreneurship within a supportive ecosystem. These programs have multiple and repeat clients around the world, whether they're government, academia, or industry, in Canada, Chile, Malaysia, throughout the Middle East, Japan, Finland, Turkey, and other countries, and of course, naturally, in the United States. Um, Dennis has more than 30 years of experience in the high-tech and clean-tech sectors. He has been a founder and CEO of companies in solar energy and smartphone security. And he was a vice president of marketing in four other venture-backed companies. He has also helped raise more than 40 million in venture funding. And given what we've done the last few days, you know how tough that can be. <laughs> um, Dennis was vice president of marketing for InfoGear Technology a very successful maker of internet appliances and the associated cloud computing solutions, which he sold to Cisco Systems. Um, their exit was more than $300 million. Um, he, was also, he has also worked for large companies in the IT space, including IBM, Sun, and Cisco. Um, we just had a speaker who's building a Cisco killer. So. Oh, great. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> she, she's really too. Um, and performed consulting assignments with Bo both Boston Consulting Group and McKinsey Company, really the two leading consulting outfits in the country, maybe the world. His experience covers a wide range of networking, computer hardware and software, and security solutions both for the commercial and the retail sectors. And in the clean tech area, he has worked on solar PV technologies, LED lighting solutions, alternative energy vehicles, residential and commercial energy, um, efficiency solutions, as well as naturally the financing mechanisms for all of the above. I asked Dennis to present this really excellent study of, on entrepreneurial ecosystems around the world. I've also asked him to speak about his experiences engaging with the startup community and just sort of familiarizing us with the whole innovation program that he drives and leads. Thank you very much. Great. Dennis. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Zelka. And, um, uh, good afternoon to all of you. I will try and keep this fast-paced and entertaining for all of you this afternoon. Um, but please, along the way, if you have any questions, don't feel shy. Raise your hand, interrupt me. It's perfectly okay. All right? Um, <clears throat> so as Professor Zelka said, I'm really here representing three different organizations this afternoon. One of them is the World Economic Forum, which is the group that studied this, that, that, that sponsored this report and published it uh, that I'm going to give you a little bit of information around. Okay? The second is Stanford Business School, um, which was the organization that actually fielded the study and compiled all the results. And the third is SRI International, um, which actually wrote the survey instrument and helped um, conduct the actual survey methodology. So I'm representing all three institutions. Feel free to ask me questions about all three, and I'll try and give you answers as best I can. Um, I'm more qualified in some than in others, OK? Um, so what is this study all about? This study was commissioned um, by the World Economic Forum about uh, a year ago. And it took us about nine months to, to run the study, compile the results, and so forth. And it was a study on entrepreneurial ecosystems around the world, OK? 
And the difference with this study is that this study was not trying to describe the different ecosystems. This study was based on a survey. So we went out and surveyed a bunch of entrepreneurs all across the globe, asking them what makes your ecosystem work and what doesn't work and give us feedback and help us understand as an entrepreneur what's, what's driving the whole ecosystem, okay? This was done with over a thousand entrepreneurs in um, uh, six continents and then there were in-depth case studies done with uh, 43 early stage companies, again, six different continents around the globe. So what did this, and so, so why, why entrepreneurial ecosystems? And the simple answer is um, entrepreneurs and small companies drive the world's economies. This is an example from the United States that just shows you on the top here the number of new jobs in blue created by startup companies. And in gray is a number of new jobs created by existing large companies. And what you can see is that for the majority of the last 25 years, existing large companies are laying people off. Not a surprise. Economic growth, job growth, economic creation, value creation comes from startups. That's why you're all here. That's why you're studying this course, okay? And just as another graphic example, all of these companies were funded by venture capital. 21% um, of the US GDP and 11% of private sector employment driven by startups funded by venture capital um, in 2010, and, and we're working on some newer data. So startups matter, okay? And what I can say from my work at SRI is in the last year, I have had teams in over a dozen different countries around the world teaching how to manage the process of innovation. Because governments around the world understand that this is vitally critical for their countries to succeed and grow. And so what did the study find out? The study found out, as we talked to these thousand entrepreneurs around the globe, that there are eight key pillars to an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Obviously, one of them is the market, right? And uh, I was just two weeks ago in Chile. Um, one of the challenges for the Chile entrepreneurial ecosystem is they don't have much of a market down there. And so they've got to figure out how to get out of Chile to the rest of the world. A second is the workforce. It's people like you um, that, that, that have the skills and the training to be able to start companies. Third is access to capital. <clears throat> Fourth is mentors, and we'll come back and talk about that a little bit more. Next is government regulation, education and training, largely a university system kind of issue, but increasingly now creeping down into secondary school education. Major universities as a subset of that as catalysts primarily the research and development that goes on in these universities as a catalyst for startups and cultural support. And I'm gonna come back and talk about that some more as well, okay? So these were the eight fundamental capabilities that we think, or the World Economic Forum thinks, need to be in place for an entrepreneurial ecosystem to work, okay? And I should say this whole study is up on the internet, feel free to Google it, WEF, um, Innovation Ecosystems, and, 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 and you can pull it down. Um, so this is the high-level summary of what was in that report, okay? And this is a heat map where blue is the best and red is the worst, okay? And what you see is across different geographies, so Silicon Valley, the U.S. as a whole, North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Asia, uh, Middle East, Africa, and then Latin America, how those different geographies ranked against those eight pillars in the ecosystem, okay? And, not surprisingly, what you see is Silicon Valley is pretty good on most of those criteria. 
The one where it's weakest is government infrastructure or government regulation, and I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. I don't know where all of you are from, um, but I can say that I've been in a number of countries over the last several months. Um, we just did a whole bunch of workshops for some folks from Sweden and Finland not too long ago. And the biggest issue in the Nordics is with cultural support for innovation. It's cultural support of risk taking, right? Big issue, big challenge. I think there's some of you here from the Nordics um, that I think you probably recognize, right? You go to Asia, similarly, cultural support, another big issue here, right? Uh, and I was just in Chile, and uh, Chile's got a whole bunch of challenges, cultural support being one, but the other big one is accessible markets, obviously, because Chile's a tiny little market, right? So there are significant differences as you go around the globe in the strength or um, uh, robustness of entrepreneurial ecosystems in different countries. Would encourage you, um, and, and you know, we'll take time for questions at the end, to, 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 to think about this and, and to actually read the study and, and, and do some research around it. Now, <clears throat> from a different perspective, this is the um, same eight pillars and the same geographies, but it's a different question that was asked. The first question was, how strong are the pillars? Are the pillars available to you? Okay. The second question was asked was, independent of whether or not they're available to you, what is most important to you as an entrepreneur? Okay. And the interesting thing, the really interesting thing here, is across all of the geographies, it's the same three pillars that came up over and over and over again. Doesn't matter where in the world you are. Okay. First is you have to have access to a market. The second is you have to have the right people. And the third is you need funding. Hence venture capital, right? That's what's required most fundamentally, no matter where you are in the world, if you want to drive innovation, if you want to drive entrepreneurship, you need people, you need money, and you need a market. Kind of not rocket science, but, but you know, real hard empirical data that says this is what matters, okay? So given that as context, I want to also give you a couple of things that are not necessarily part of the WEF study, but food for thought, okay? And the first is if you look at the United States, and since many of you are international, if you look at, you know, maybe migrating over here and starting a company, 40% of the VC deals and dollars in the US in Silicon Valley. Next is Boston, or New York, and then the third is Boston. Those three represent over 70% of the dollars and deals going on in the United States. Um, and um, there's a good reason if you decide to move to the states to consider moving to one of those three locations. Okay, um, if you're not in one of those locations, it's going to take you 10% longer to raise money. Okay, um, and if you are successful and you want to sell your company, it's a heck of a lot easier if if you're actually in Silicon Valley. It's where deals get done, and the rates of financing are going to be cheaper. Okay, so. Um, Think about that. That's why Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley. It's why it sort of self-perpetuates. It, it, it's the, the, the data is it, it's easier and it's cheaper to get deals done there. Um, <clears throat> now, at the same time, I also want to mention, since you do represent a wide variety of geographies here, this is the VC confidence in biopharma across different geographies. Okay. So if any of you are thinking about a drug company or something like that, Brazil's a wonderful market, China's a wonderful market, Taiwan's a wonderful market. If you're German and you're trying to do a biopharma deal, good luck. 
okay? Um, not so great. So, so, and if you look at different sectors, clean tech, semiconductors, cloud computing, et cetera, there will be big variations by geography. One of the things we at SRI tell our clients as we go around the globe is even as, as <clears throat> and to pick on the Nordics just for a second, Finland, as an example, spends today three, over 3% 3 of its GDP on R&D. It's one of the highest in the world. That's a wonderful thing. I applaud Finland for doing that. Despite the fact that they do that, the total amount of R&D spending they do in Finland, it's about $11 billion a year, okay? The U.S. spends $400 billion a year on R&D. If you take that R&D spending and spread it like jam on a piece of toast, you're not going to make an impact in any given area. And so one of the things we try and encourage governments to do as we go around the globe and run our innovation programs is choose some areas of focus. Figure out what's going to matter for your geography, figure out where you have skills, and, and Focus your resources. Question, sir. That number for the U.S. R&D, those yes. figures, um, is that including military R&D? Uh, yes, that include. well, it, I, I'd have to go back and double check the source, but, but it's the, again, it's World Economic Forum data, and I don't honestly recall what they include in that number. Okay. But the U.S. is, by and large, number one in R&D spending globally. China's number two and catching up fast. Um, and then after that, there's a big drop off. US is about 400, China's about 250. Next closest country is under 100. Okay? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now, something else to think about since you all are wrestling with venture capital and so forth. This is a chart that just shows the number of active venture capital firms. That's the solid line on the top over the last couple of decades. What you see is coming up to the 2000 bubble, it was going great guns and everybody was starting a venture capital firm. Bubble burst, no new funds created, and what's happening right now is all those funds that were created back then, they're all closing. And most of those firms, pretty lousy track record. And so they're not able to raise a new fund, so they're going out of business, okay? The venture capital industry is changing. It is consolidating right now, and there's some big changes going on as, as a result of that. One of the <clears throat> other things that has happened as a result is there's now all kinds of new investment sources. Angels didn't really exist prior to, to 10 years ago. Okay? Crowdsourcing, crowdfunding didn't exist. There are now lots of other ways to start a company. Depending on what you all have in mind uh, and, and what you're trying to do, I would think hard about, do I even want to approach a venture capitalist? Uh, do I need that kind of money or not? And in many cases, the answer is no. Okay, So something else for you to think about. Now, um, and, and just as proof points, all of these companies were started with uh, initial funding from a source other than traditional venture capital, okay? So it, it is happening, it is real. And last point I will make on the WEF survey um, that, that, that uh, again, may be relevant to some of you as you are going home to your countries and, and wrestling with how do we help. This takes time. This is not something that happens quickly. Um, we do a lot of work with Stanford. Um, we've studied their OTLs, their, their Office of Technology Licensing, the group that spins all the IP out of Stanford University. They've been in existence for 40 years. The first 25 years, they lost money, okay? They only made money in the last 15 years. And, um, I tell that to university rectors and vice rectors and chancellors and vice chancellors all around the globe, and they never want to hear that. They all want to think, we can turn our research out and turn it profitable tomorrow. It takes time, okay? 
And so that's one of the things you need to think about. And one of the programs we run, um, we're running actually right now with the, country, with the government of Chile, the government of Japan, the government of Malaysia, and we have proposed to several other governments, is, is basically it's a business plan competition where we go into the country, help those organizations identify promising venture ideas run some courses and, and, and workshops for them in country, and then eventually pick the best five or 10 and we bring them to Silicon Valley for a month. Um, the whole purpose behind programs like that is to try and create what we call lighthouse accounts. Um, examples, success stories, whatever you want to call them. Um, that is a critical requirement. And so uh, I don't know if you all are ready to be what, what uh, we would call a champion yet for your idea or your project. But we think that finding success stories, finding case studies of people that are successful and publicizing the heck out of them is one of the most effective ways of trying to jumpstart an innovation ecosystem and address some of those cultural barriers that, that we were talking about earlier. Sir. Um, <clears throat> government, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm fully so understanding you the question. To, to no, 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 we do not use lobbyists. Uh, as SRI, we are a nonprofit research institution, uh, and because we've, uh, and I'll talk about SRI in a minute, but because we've been in Silicon Valley for 65 years and done a lot of innovations over those years, um, when governments send delegations to Silicon Valley, which they do all the time, we are typically a, uh, a stop on the, the tour schedule. And so we go up, my team gets up there, we give them a story about what innovation means that I'll get to in a minute. Um, and we find often that there's a lot of resonance to that. Um, and so then they ask the next logical question, which is, okay, if innovation's important, you have a process for managing it, how do we implement it in our country? And so let me talk about that in about three slides, if I may. Okay, thanks. Um, and I'm going to talk about government here in, in just actually the next couple of slides. So um, government is a big challenge to, to, to your question. And our perspective as SRI, um, I, I should not say that this is a WEF statement. This is really more an SRI Stanford statement, is that <laughs> Government policies are most effective when they do empower private actors, and let me get to that. So <clears throat> what are the things that we believe that governments do well, and should do, and, and, and do right? Help educate people, uh, students, facilitate labor mobility, um, provide communication, and grant funding. And what we do see in almost every country we're active in is there are lots of government grant programs, okay, to provide professors with grants to do their research, to provide professors, grad students, entrepreneurs funding to start the transition from, um, you know, research towards commercialization, okay? Um, this is an example from Singapore of what the government did right. And these are quotes from the WEF study. Uh, so, you know, in Singapore, a small country, he can call up a member of parliament, get right to the top, figure out what's going on. They can get money, and they can, because of government policies in Singapore, easily recruit people and get them into the country. These are examples of what people can do well, government can do well. This is some of the stuff that government can do to get in the way. Um, they can try and protect the existing big companies because they're the big employers and the big taxpayers and the guys with access to all the politicians. They can create bureaucracy. Governments around the world are wonderful at creating bureaucracy um, and complexity. They can be inconsistent in how they enforce laws and, and, and you can read the rest of that. Quote from France, again from the WEF study. I don't know if there are any French students here. If so, forgive me. Uh, <clears throat> but. 
you know, you can't hire and fire people freely in France. I've been there as a startup. Um, I, I hired a couple of people in France, and then when we shrank, it took me two years to get them off my payroll. And as a startup, that's just really, really painful. Um, government purchasing policies in France are biased towards buying from big companies in France. And the marginal tax rate, 75%. So every successful entrepreneur in France is trying to figure out how to move to Luxembourg or Belgium or someplace else, right? Um, so not just to pick on France, you know, to pick on the United States since we're here. Um, too many rules and regulations. That's probably the biggest complaint of most entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley is it's just painful to, to get stuff started. Um, and the American legal system is, is overly litigious. Um, people can file a lawsuit kind of willy-nilly and bog you down and, and hold you hostage, and, and it's just painful. So we're not perfect either, okay? So just to, to, to be fair on all of that. So there's, um, there's a lot of data in, in the WEF study. Um, again, it's publicly available. Would encourage you, you know, if you ever need bedtime reading and want to fall asleep quickly, go download it from the internet and, and, and you can, uh, can, 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 can peruse it at your, at your leisure. Now let me switch gears for a second and talk to you a little bit about SRI, okay? Um, SRI, Stanford Research Institute, founded by Stanford University in 1946. Um, in 1969, 1970, the middle of the Vietnam War, we were doing a lot of Defense Department research, uh, to, to the question earlier, and the students didn't like it. So they protested, and we separated from the university. Okay? So today, SRI is a legally independent, nonprofit research institution in Menlo Park, about three miles from the Stanford campus, legally separate institutions. Now, it happens to be that three of the board members of SRI are Stanford professors, a lot of our researchers are also on the faculty at Stanford, but we're legally separate institutions, okay? Today, we're about 2,500 staff members. We do about um, $550 million in contract R&D. Uh, today, roughly a third of that is defense-related, and we do a lot of work with some of these other areas that I'll describe to you in a minute. So because we're in Silicon Valley, obviously a big group in IT. Um, if any of you are IT oriented or focused, uh, happy to talk to you afterwards about that. We, um, just as a point of interest, um, we run the Bot Hunter Network for the US government. So we run the network that discovers bots all around the world and we feed that back to the government as well as to companies like McAfee and Symantec and all of those kinds of guys. We do a lot of work with computer security. The other one that you all probably have heard of um, is Siri on the iPhone was invented by that group here at, 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 at SRI. A big group as well focused on learning and education systems. So one of the things that SRI believes is as we've studied young children as they grow up, a critical, a critical point for any young child, age 10, 12, in, in that range, is they're coming up and they're learning their math and at, at tw 10 or 12, somewhere in there, they take algebra, okay? If they don't get algebra, that's a problem. Because without algebra, you're never going to get to trig and to calculus. And without that, you're never going to get into engineering and be able to, to you know, contribute from a, 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 an engineering kind of development mentality. Today in the United States, 50% of students fail algebra, okay? that disqualifies half of the kids in the U.S. from ever being really full participants in the U.S. economy. We think that's a critical problem, okay? And at the same time, what we observe is universities around the globe, uh, excuse me, school systems around the globe are spending billions of dollars to buy tablets and put them into classrooms. But the teachers don't know what to do with them. They've got no software, no training, it's a problem. And so this group, the, 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 one of the big focuses of that group is on how to use technology in the classroom 
to actually help kids learn better and faster. And in particular, we're focused on math, okay? Because we think that's a critical skill for people to grow and prosper. So that's the second group. Big group focused on biotechnology and health. Um, uh, the, the guy that runs this is also a professor at UCSF um, in, in the genetic uh, 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 team up there. A um, lot of work in cancer detection and cancer uh, treatment, Alzheimer's treatments, uh, 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 tropical drugs or tropical diseases, a lot of stuff like that. Um, we build a lot of big engineering systems as well. That's where the bulk of our defense research still takes place today. Um, any of you been up to the Stanford campus? Yeah. Okay. Have, you have seen the dish up, up in the foothills, the big radar dish up there? We built that in 1960. We still run it today. Um, and piece of trivia for all of you, um, that satellite dish on the Stanford campus calibrates all the GPS satellites around the world. So if your GPS signal ever goes screwball, and, and we're off by a couple of miles, you can blame SRI, okay? So um, we, we run big systems like that. We also run observatories in, in, in Greenland, um, in Antarctica, um, in, uh, in, in, in Puerto Rico. Um, and Paul Allen, uh, the guy that, that co-funded uh, Microsoft, he's actually uh, sponsoring the SETI project right now, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence and we run that program for him. So that's another example of the kind of research we do. Um, and then there's a big group here uh, focused on material science, uh, nanotechnologies, and so forth. Um, two areas that I'll just note here. Uh, one is biofuels. We're doing a lot of work with biofuels here. And the other is carbon capture, uh, trying to figure out how to pull cap uh, carbon out of the air and, and, and get, it, get it into the ground or into the ocean. Um, and then my group, which is focused on innovation, technology, and economic development. What's the, what's the biggest sector here that the um, half, uh, half a billion dollar come from? Um, the biggest group is actually the engineering and systems group. Um, uh, it probably represents 35, 40% of the business, but, but it's pretty well spread around, uh, around all five. Okay. So um, some of the stuff that we've invented, um, any of you have used a mouse? Uh, that was invented by SRI. We licensed it to Park, who then sold it to Steve Jobs. Uh, but if you ever come to SRI, I can actually show you the original mouse in, in our bookcase in the lobby. I thought it was um, Xerox. Nope. We invented it and licensed it to Xerox. So if, if any of you, again, uh, have time, get onto YouTube. Um, and look for the mother of all demos, okay? Just old black and white video shot in 1969, but uh, one of our researchers, has got this guy by the name of Doug Engelbart, 1969 demonstrated the mouse, demonstrated hypertext, demonstrated the fundamentals of the internet, and, and, and uh, um, really cool <laughs> demo if you, if you ever have time. Um, the internet, unlike Al Gore, we actually did help invent the internet. We were, we were one of the first three nodes on the ARPANET, which was the predecessor to the internet. Um, it was UCLA and SRI that transmitted the first packet over, over, over the ARPANET. Um, any of you watch HDTV? We set the standard for HDTV um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So lots of cool things have come out of SRI over time. But more importantly, and, and to the question of, of how do we sell governments, um, the thing that SRI does every year is with our 2,500 staff and our 500 plus million dollars of R&D, every year pretty predictably for the last 10 years, we know that those researchers and that R&D is going to generate about 500 patent disclosure forms. So these are forms that our researchers fill out saying, I've invented something that I think is worth patenting, okay? We don't file patents on all of that. We go through a filtering process and we figure it out. But our goal every year is to spin out five to seven new startup companies. So roughly 1%. 1% of the ideas that our inventors invent will end up in a startup. About 10% end up being licensed to somebody. About 
end up in a startup. If you look at Stanford University stats, or MIT stats, or Carnegie Mellon stats, because um, all of the stuff is public, it's pretty similar ratios. Okay, so not everything that a university professor invents is going to result in a startup. The challenge, the real question, is how do you find the ones that should, the ones that can. Okay, and so my team at SRI is chartered with trying to help people address that challenge. So what we see is that countries, governments, universities, and large enterprises all around the globe are trying to figure out how to manage this process of innovation. Okay? Not how to manage a process of invention. That they know how to do. Throw money at professors. Professors are really good at doing research. Okay? It's how do you take the research and turn it into commercial products? How do you innovate? That, that's kind of the challenge. And so over the last um, 20 years, what, what we have developed is a process for this. And so we believe, and our pitch to a government, is that successful innovation on a repeated basis, not a one-off basis, but a repeated basis, can't be the result of luck, right? You need a process for managing this. Um, and so we have developed a process for doing that, and we, sh we again, as a nonprofit, we're not trying to hoard it and keep it secret. We share this with governments and universities and enterprises around the globe. So what is this process? This is normally um, a two-day workshop. So you all have been in here since 9 o'clock yesterday morning. You've got it easy. Um, if you were in one of my workshops, I'd be working even harder. Um, but, but we take people through a two-day workshop on um, what we call the five disciplines of innovation, okay? And the five disciplines of innovation, I'll give you the, the, the three-minute version of this, okay? Lots and lots and lots of professors, scientists, engineers invent new things. That's the easy part. Not really so easy, but that's the easy part. We believe that innovation means taking that invention and getting it to the market. Okay? And if you're going to do that, step one is identifying who's the customer. And for many, many researchers, many, many scientists, that's a hard question. That's really not straightforward. That's really not something they understand very well. And so we take people through an exercise to help them really identify who a customer is, okay? And I'll give you just an, a, a, a quick example of that. Um, you're a medical researcher. You invent a new cure for cancer. Great, wonderful. Um, customer's the doctor, and he's going to give it to the patient who's the user, and everything's cool, right? Well, we try and parse that a little bit, and we say, well, Okay, the doctor is going to be the person that gives the drug to the patient, but where's the doctor going to get the drug? Well, from the hospital. Okay, well, if the hospital's going to stock the drug, their purchasing department, where are they going to buy it from? They're going to buy it from a big pharma company like a Merck or a Pfizer or a GlaxoSmithKline. Those people aren't going to stock it and they're not going to sell it to the hospital unless the insurance company agrees they're going to pay for it, right? What does the insurance company care about? Profit shareholders. Profit shareholders making money, right? What does the doctor care about? Getting the patient healthy. Those are really different objectives, okay? And so we walk people through how do you parse your customers apart and then identify what is their what we call important need, okay? What is it that's going to motivate that customer to whip their wallet out, open it out, and spend money? And again, that's non-trivial. Um, as, as, as Professor Zelka was, was saying, I've been VP of marketing for a variety of venture-funded startups. One of them, um, a company in, in the wireless security area um, about uh, 10 years ago, 
I would walk into customers all the time, big banks, big insurance companies, and I'd give them my half hour, 45 minute pitch. And at the end of it, they'd say, Dennis, thank you and curse you. Okay? Thank you because you've now educated me and made me smarter about a security threat, and you've given me a potential solution. Curse you because I've now got a new thing to worry about, right? And the problem is, as a chief security officer, I got a laundry list this long of things to worry about. You now come in about 26, and I've got budget and staff to deal with the top five. Come back in two years, maybe you'll get you know, to the top of the stack. I had an interesting problem, but not an important one, okay? There's a big difference. And so we take people through an exercise to identify who's their customer and what's really gonna drive them and motivate them to take action now. Because if they don't, you're, you're in for a really tough, tough <coughs> haul, okay? Um, and so, that's the first discipline of innovation, is identifying a customer and an important enough need that's going to motivate people to act. If you can do that, then what we do is run a second set of exercises around the process of what we call value creation. And how many of you have heard of this thing called an elevator pitch? Okay, so you've all heard of an elevator pitch, right? Um, I'll tell you that that same concept is really important, is more and more important today than it's ever been before. Not because we're all riding in elevators more, okay? But because nine times out of 10, when you call somebody, what do you get? You get voicemail, right? You don't get a live person. When somebody leaves you a voicemail and it's somebody you've never, you don't know, how much of that voicemail do you listen to? Right? You, I mean, somebody's got to grab your attention in about 15 seconds if, if you're going to listen. You all get emails from people you've never heard of before, right? How much of that email do you read before you send it, before you hit delete? Maybe the header, if you're generous, the first paragraph, right? That's the same concept as an elevator pitch. In the first paragraph of your email in a 15 second voicemail in an elevator, it's really critical that all of us are able to communicate what we're doing and grab somebody's attention and get them to want to give us more time, okay? And so we have a whole series of exercises and some science and some formulas around how to create a value proposition that'll grab somebody's attention and get them to pay attention to you, okay? And so that's what the whole discipline of value creation is all about. So if you can identify your customer and an important need and you can tell your story really well, the other thing, the third discipline that we've discovered at SRI is critical to successful innovation is something we call champions. Because what we have observed across multiple cultures is that innovation is hard. Innovation means you need to go break some rules. And somebody has to have the passion, the energy, the determination to go do that. Now, I will observe here that there are some real cultural differences as we go around the globe. I did a workshop about two months ago in Japan, and the Japanese university had a real problem with this concept of a champion. We did a workshop in China not too long ago, and actually, and I did one in Taiwan about six weeks ago, and they similarly had a problem with this concept of a champion, that this concept of somebody rebelling against their superiors and breaking the rules to make something happen, not really well accepted in some of these cultures, okay? It's very American. American was, America was founded by a whole bunch of rebels, 
right? We rebelled against the English 200 some odd years ago. My parents rebelled against the, the communist Chinese 50 years ago, right? It, America is a country of independent thinkers, of rebels. And so the concept of a champion is actually one that we believe in strongly at SRI, but that needs adaption, adaptation to different cultures around the globe. Still think it's important. Still believe that innovation isn't going to happen unless you have somebody who's passionate, energetic, driven enough to push their project forward. But you need to think about how's that going to be adapted to your culture. Okay. If you have that champion, you're still going to need a team because nobody can do it by themselves. And so we run a whole series of exercises around how do you build effective teams to actually identify the skills you need, put them in place, develop a common vision, develop common rewards to be able to make the team successful. Okay? Something I will observe here that is different, again, culture by culture, um, is that if you take any startup here in Silicon Valley, Probably at, at, at the early stages, I would be amazed if at least 90, 95% of the employees did not have stock options or stock in the company, right? When I go to different countries, I'll pick on Malaysia now. Uh, when I go to Malaysia, the guys that found the company, they want to keep 80% of the company and they don't want to share any of it with anybody, okay? So building teams and figuring out how to structure compensation to motivate everybody, big part of, of being successful. And then you're going to need the support of your organization, okay? Whether that's your university, your government, your large enterprise, you're going to need support if you're going to successfully innovate. So there are five disciplines of innovation that we believe in have to be there to be successful. Um, again, this is a much longer workshop. Um, interestingly, for all of you, uh, if, if you're interested, we will be um, taking all of this and turning it into a MOOC. So you've heard of Udacity, Coursera, those kinds of guys. We're, we're putting this Five Disciplines of Innovation workshop up as a MOOC. Um, it will be launched in Q1 of next year. Uh, so if any of you are interested, um, please let me know and I'm happy to connect you and put you in touch with, with the folks that are doing that. Um, for those of you, Sweden, Finland, Chile, uh, possibly Norway, Malaysia, Japan, Taiwan, your governments may be funding it. So if any of you are in some of those, let me know and I can again hook you up with the right people and, and, and potentially get you connected there. So why do we do all of this? What do we try and do? What are the benefits of, of, of attending this workshop? What we're trying to do is help institutions develop a faster, more predictable process for managing innovation, help them build an innovation ecosystem, and then connect them to our network. Um, and that's really the objective of what we do. Um, and as we do that, the team that teaches these workshops are a bunch of guys like me, old farts, uh, semi-retired, you know, been successful one way or another, don't really need to make money anymore, and so we're interested in sharing our experiences and our knowledge and trying to help people from around the globe um, uh, get their company started. So that's really what we're trying to do. We've all raised venture capital before and, 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 and been through this exercise. Um, as I mentioned, we do this all around the globe. Uh, don't know if all of your countries are up there. The one country we haven't gotten to yet is Africa. I'm still working on that. Uh, but, but we're actually in a discussion with the guy in, 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 uh, um, in uh, one of the, one of the, in Namibia, I think, right now about potentially starting something. So, so we're, we're working on it, but would love to, to get more active there. But we're, we're, we're active pretty much around the globe. So um, that's the end of my prepared remarks. I'm happy to take questions, uh, comments, ad lib, uh, as, as, as you would like. Any? Questions? Please. Uh, how do you compensate your researchers? Uh, like, for instance, the ones sure. who go from Great their question. Own to venture capital, yes. like startups? Or so so um, it's a very simple rule. Um, for any, if you're an inventor or researcher at SRI, you help um, invent something. 
and it's licensed to somebody, or you spin it out and SRI gets stock, whatever comes into SRI, one third of what comes into SRI goes to the research team. Okay? The team then decides how they want to divvy that up among themselves. One third goes to the department. So for instance, the biosciences department or the computer science department. Because our philosophy is basically if they've successfully invented something that could get spun out, they're more likely to be able to do it again. So here's a little bit more money, do some more research. And then one third goes to the corporation. Um, and that's well understood, it's widely publicized, and it's essentially the same ratio as Stanford has. Um, so one third at Stanford goes to the professor or the, the grad students that did the invention, one third to the department, one third to the university. Okay, other questions? Yes. What kind of um, <clears throat> new clean technologies were you involved with? I heard mention of... Uh, yes. Uh, so so um, I was not personally involved in inventing any new clean technologies. I was more um, involved in several different startups focused on how to finance the installation of new different types of clean technology, whether that's solar energy, energy efficiency, LED lights, HVAC improvements, all these sorts of things. Um, and uh, um, I know a reasonable amount about the ways that those things get financed, at least here in the United States. Um, and I've done a little bit of consulting for some companies that are trying to take those models and adapt them to other countries. So that's really what I've been focused on. Happy to talk to you afterwards. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Any, any, yes, please. Vince, you have such an interesting background. You did large enterprises. I guess you worked with IBM. Yep. You worked with the major consulting firms, mm -hmm. you've worked with startups, and now you're working with a nonprofit, quasi-academic right. sort of thing. <clears throat> Tell me about how is it, how do you see these things being different? How well, do you, <laughs> you have another three hours? <laughs> um, they're, they're, they're hugely different. Um, and um, What was your trajectory actually? start with the consulting? I started the with the consulting. So I, I worked for McKinsey before business school and BCG after business school. Um, and I think consulting is a wonderful place for a young person um, to learn a lot about business strategy, learn a lot about presentation skills, learn a lot about how to relate to and interface to senior management. Um, and understand what really drives customers, determine what's really an important need uh, per, per discipline number one. Um, so I think consulting is a wonderful um, uh, uh, place to continue an, an education. I really viewed it as an extension of, of, of my MBA. Um, but consulting um, can be frustrating. Uh, and and I, I will admit to a certain degree of frustration today because I go into different countries, whether it be Chile or Finland or, or, Nor or Norway, and I can observe problems, I can give recommendations, but I can't do anything about them. Um, I can teach skills, but I can't make the skills happen. Um, and so there's a certain degree of frustration with any consulting job. Um, which is why I left consulting and went into industry because I actually wanted to do it and make it happen. Uh, and for me personally, uh, I worked for big companies from 1984 till 1995. Um, no, actually 1998. So, uh, so I worked for big companies for, for almost 13 years. Um, and again, for me, that was a wonderful way to learn. Um, and and, and uh, I credit IBM, which was one of my first big employers, for teaching me all about s the skills necessary to be a manager in a big corporation. Now, on the flip side of that, I'll say that I have two children today, um, one of whom's 27, the other's 25, um, and neither of them's working for a big company. They're both working for startups, both of them in Silicon Valley. Um, and, you know, uh, my son, who graduated from Stanford two years ago, they did a survey of his graduating class, and they asked the graduating seniors, uh, undergrads, not graduate students, what do you expect to be doing in five years after graduation? Over half of his class said they expect to be working for a startup. 
not necessarily the CEO of a startup, you know, the, the founder, but over half expected to be working for a startup. That's a phenomenal, phenomenal number. And, and you know, when I go around the world, it doesn't matter where in the world I go, and I ask the university, what would your student body say today, right? And they say 5%, 2%. I mean, it, it's, it's radically different. And, and so um, if I were coming out of school today, um, what I've shared with my children is, is um, I don't think that going to a big company today is necessarily the right thing to do. I think going to a startup, uh, you can learn a lot more, you can learn a lot faster, um, and, and you'll, you'll get a whole different set of experiences that way. Other other questions? Yes, Why please. Why do you think uh, Asian universities score so low, acting as catalysts for, for startups? Why do I think? Uh, no, why? Yeah, why do you think that's the case? Um, several different answers uh, associated with that. Um, a generic kind of challenge um, with universities around the globe um, is you've all heard the publisher perish statement for, for university professors. And that's true pretty much everywhere. Um, that professors have incentives to publish papers, to, to write articles, to get them in peer-reviewed journals. Typically they get paid for all that stuff. Um, the incentives in most countries that I've been to, including most of the developed countries, for patenting and commercialization aren't weighted appropriately to balance those scales out. Um, if, if there's any incentive to do a patent, it's the same incentive as to do a paper, but to do a patent takes three times longer and, and, and three times more work. And so the professors aren't motivated to do it. That's part of the challenge. A second challenge um, is that depending on your country, um, there is still not, I think, a universal acceptance of what is the role of a university. If you go back, uh, I was recently talking about this with, with a group from Lund University in, 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 in Sweden. Um, the university is 450 years old. 450 years ago, when it was founded, the role of the university was to protect knowledge. They had a bunch of monks in, in, in robes, hand copying manuscripts. Right? Their, their role was to protect knowledge. Then about uh, 1800, they started accepting students. And the role became education for, for, for students. And that lasted for about 100 years. And then about 1900, they actually started doing research. And then that accelerated in the 1940s and 50s dramatically. What the transformation that is happening right now is that universities are now starting to be seen, at least in some, some geographies, as the engine for economic growth. So if you look at Silicon Valley, Stanford, Berkeley, UCSF, San Jose State, those are the universities that are driving the innovation engine in, in Silicon Valley. You look at Harvard, MIT, came, uh, you, know, Har you look at Boston, MIT, uh, uh, Harvard, et cetera, are driving innovation there. You go to Baltimore, Johns Hopkins is driving innovation. You go to Austin, same thing, UT Austin. Um, not all university management, rectors, vice rectors, chancellors, vice chancellors, have accepted or embraced or agree with that new role for a university. Um, and some of them are actually saying, well, since my budgets are getting squeezed all the time, I'm going to just focus on education, to heck with the research even. Um, and I think that's going in the wrong direction. But that's, that's, that's a challenge that um, I think uh, is, is bigger than SRI to, to solve. Last time I raised venture capital, uh, or was trying to raise venture capital, I wasn't successful the last time. Um, in a venture meeting, you may only get half an hour. You may get an hour if you're lucky. And venture capitalists see a lot of deals. Um, and they're really 
try and understand pretty quickly. It's not quite an elevator pitch, but, but they're under trying to understand pretty quickly what you're all about and what you're trying to do. Um, if you go to any number of venture capital websites um, and, and pick your favorite ones, they all have a recommended pitch somewhere hidden on their website. Go find it. They're all, however, going to be something similar to this. Okay. Um, so what I have told teams in Japan, in Chile, in Malaysia, if you're putting together a 10 slide, if you got half an hour, 20 minutes, here's the 10 slides I would do, right? Um, grab their attention up front, hook them with something. Um, what is the need that's so compelling that somebody has to solve it now? Can you tell me what that is? That's slide one. Slide two is how big is the market? Because if it isn't at least half a billion dollars, at least venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, not interested. Um, how are you going to solve the problem? What are the benefits you're going to provide the customer? And who have you talked to that's going to validate your statements? Why are you better than the competition? What's your business model? Who's on your team? What's your milestones? Give me a sense of your financials. And what are you asking me for? Okay. That's the 10 slide pitch that I would put together. Um, it is not easy. It, it uh, takes, I would say if you were trying to raise funding, I would budget six months. And it's going to be more than a full-time job for whomever's leading that effort. And that's the job of the CEO of the startup, is, is to go do that. So I don't know if that answers your question. But question, sir. The last like the final point on the close, what would you include in that, in that slide of that category, the types of things? Um, what I would tell, uh, depending, what, what we coach people on is um, when you go into your first venture capital meeting, the whole goal of your first meeting is not to raise money. The goal of your first meeting is to get the second meeting. Okay? Um, and so what you're trying to do in the first meeting is get them interested enough that they'll give you another hour to dive deep into this. And the order varies slightly, but typically, first meeting's an introductory meeting. Second meeting is going to be an hour, and they're going to tell you, OK, Dennis, um, come back in a week. I want to understand the market. And we're going to spend an hour, and we're going to do nothing but understand the market. What customers have you talked to? How well do you understand it? What's the need? They're going to dive deep on that. If you convince them the market's real, then they'll say, OK, come back next week and tell me how you're going to solve the problem. And they'll spend an hour understanding your solution. If they believe that, then they'll say, OK, come back next week. Tell me about your team. If they believe in the team, then they'll tell you, come back next week. Tell us about your distribution plans, your go-to-market plan. Then the next week, your financials. And, and they will go through a series, and this, this will take six, eight, ten weeks, of due diligence meetings. And they'll be scrubbing it all the way along to really try and understand what's going on. But the first meeting is to just hook them enough that they're going to give you the second meeting. Okay. Um, so what I would ask them for is I would tell them, over time, um, I think we're going to need X million dollars. First raise is going to be, you know, Y million or Y hundred thousand. And my goal is the next meeting with you. So do you, would you actually bluntly say, like, after you get to that, I would like to meet again and what are your thoughts? Or how would yeah. you say Yes, that? yes. I would absolutely ask for the next meeting. So it's like a, it's like a date. Yes, <laughs> very much so. Other questions? Prof? I've, in, I've, heard, I've heard rumors of great stories about Siri and how it came about. And yes. The decision making about how to get it out. I wonder what, what you're at liberty to speak about. Well, um, I wasn't actually at SRI when that happened. Um, but what I have uh, read and learned um, is that Siri is actually the result of a 10-year, $150 million research grant that SRI got from the U.S. government. 
Um, and the original motivation was we've all seen the John Wayne World War II kind of movies with the soldiers and the walkie-talkies. Well, soldiers don't carry walkie-talkies anymore. Um, every soldier in the US military today carries an Android smartphone. They're issued an Android smartphone instead of a walkie-talkie. What the Army several years ago was trying to do was figure out how to turn that into a more useful communication device for the soldier. So one application was talk into it in English and have Pashtun or Arabic come out the other end. Or listen to Pashtun and Arabic and then translate it into English. One application. Second application was for a squad commander to be able to understand what the drones and the satellites up in the air could tell him about the battlefield. All those sorts of applications, they were looking for a computer-assisted um, learning uh, organizer that would help someone on the battlefield organize their, their lives. That was the original research. $150 million, 10 years. We had researchers from 26 different universities. So, Harvard, MIT, Cambridge, uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, all over the, the globe were involved in creating this for the military. We successfully delivered that to the military. Won a big award for it. The way the US government works is all that research that they pay us for, um, they have the rights to use it in the, the government. We have the rights to commercialize it. And so we had this what we called at the time a decision engine, a decision tool, and, and a, a, well, actually more than a decision tool, a do tool. We wanted, we thought we had the ability to talk to a device and have it do something for you. We tried to figure out where that would be helpful. So we spent about a year and a half going through different markets and applications for that before we decided on the smartphone market. Spun Siri out. It was independent for about a year and a half before Steve Jobs came and bought it. Okay. Um, we, however, SRI, still retain the core IP rights behind that. So today, um, we have licensed that to, for instance, a Japanese auto manufacturer. Can't say whom. But there will be a Japanese car with a Siri-like interface in it soon. So you'll be driving down the road and be able to talk to your car and have it do things for you. Um, we have licensed it to a Spanish bank, BBVA, this is public, um, where you can now call up, or actually this is in beta right now, but you can call up the bank and say, hey BBVA, I forgot to pay my mortgage this month, can you pay it for me please? And the bank, the, the engine for the bank will be able to know who you are what accounts you have, and have an intelligent conversation with you about when do you want to pay it, which account do you want to take the money from, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're also taking that same concept, for instance, and putting it into consumer electronics. So imagine you're in your kitchen. Um, you go to the refrigerator, you open up the freezer door, you pull something out. You talk to your refrigerator. Say, hey, I, uh, I'm taking out a, a, a bag of jalza. Put that on the shopping list for me, please. Okay? Or Swedish meatballs or whatever the case may be. Then you unwrap it, throw it in the microwave, and you talk to your microwave. Say, cook Swedish meatballs. So you don't have to push any buttons. It goes off to the internet, figures out how long to program the microwave for, and it does it all for you automatically. Okay? <laughs> Those sorts of capabilities are all driven by the same core engine of voice recognition and some artificial intelligence and rules around a certain application. And so we are taking that same Siri-like capability and building it into you know, different markets and, and, and different, uh, different venues. Um, uh, you all are probably still too young to have children. One of my colleagues um, has a six-month-old son at home. Um, and his son um, is, uh, is, you know, watches his mom and dad 
and is already reaching out and trying to grab their smartphone and their tablet, right? Because that's what they interact with at home. We were having this active debate the other day about whether or not his son will ever use one of these uh, because it's not what he'll grow up with. And, and the new computing paradigm, whether it's this or these or something, um, you know, it's not at all clear that, that, that what we're going to be interacting with and the way we're going to interact with them is what, you know, we today are, are, are used to. It's going to change pretty radically, we believe, over the next five to ten years. So, something else to, to think about. And, and, and just along those lines, another piece of food for thought. You've all heard of Moore's Law with semiconductors. By 2030, you'll be able to buy for $1,000 a piece of computing hardware with more computing power than the human brain. Okay? So for $1,000, you can buy a brain smarter than you. Okay? I guarantee you one thing, that will not run Windows. So who's <laughs> going to invent that operating system? You know, what applications are going to be on it? There's a whole other world out there um, waiting, to be, waiting to be solved. So that's a whole other challenge that we're, we're uh, contemplating. So um, I really enjoyed meeting all of you. Um, again, if, uh, if I can be of any assistance, um, Professor Zelka knows how to get a hold of me. Uh, and, and feel free to email me questions. And I'm and happy to, to, to try and help you in whatever way I can. Okay. Thank you, Thank you for your time.